Welcome to the first in a new series of II events where we'll be uncovering the big philosophical issues behind the everyday news headlines in search of new ways of thinking that might enable us to create a better world. Now, during the pandemic, the world has become transfixed with a number of virus deaths. These figures are not only a recognition of the personal tragedy involved, they're all, they've also been central to our understanding of the epidemic and to uh, help governments determine their response. But can we be confident of the numbers? And what do they tell us about how we should act? With me, an influential panel who are ideally placed to answer this question. Michael Levitt is a biophysicist, a professor at uh, Stanford University, who won the Nobel Prize in 2013. Ant Johnson is an epidemiologist specializing in infectious disease and professor at University College London and a former advisor to government. Toby Young is associate editor of the right-leaning political magazine, The Spectator, and he's recently launched a website titled Lockdown Skeptics. And David Alexander, professor of risk and disaster reduction at UCL and also a former advisor to government. Now, if we're going to understand the numbers, Let's begin with the question of how we in fact determine the cause of death and whether we can do so with any clarity. Now, medics have to make this decision whenever they're completing a death certificate. How do they determine the cause of death? And is this the same across the world? Anne? Well, the registration of death is done through our Office for National Statistics and it's a complex process in that a doctor, when they fill in a certificate in this country, will write down the number, the factors that have, may have contributed that death, including what is described as the underlying cause of death. Um, so the most robust figures on deaths will co come from what is registered with Office of National Statistics, and we get those figures in detail every week. So there's a distinction between the immediate cause of death and an underlying cause of death. That's absolutely correct. So somebody, when the, the doctor will fill in the conditions that may have contributed to the death, which could include uh, coronavirus, but it also might may include un other conditions, for example, having had a former stroke or having had a heart attack. Ultimately, for example, if someone, to give an example, if somebody had terminal cancer, they might eventually die from pneumonia, but the underlying cause of death would be regarded as their cancer. What, what ONS is doing now in the counts is, is, uh, is uh, giving numbers where coronavirus occurs in either part of the death certificate, as I understand it. And that's what the ONS counts are currently coming from. No. And in terms of the underlying cause, I mean, is, this, is it always apparent what the underlying cause is? And would it include causes like poverty or poor diet? Uh, so those conditions, we know essentially that there are many conditions related to poverty and to socioeconomic determinants which increase our risk of, of, of dying, but the actual cause of death would be ascribed to the clinical condition which resulted in that death. So do you think the number of COVID deaths uh, tells us whether they have died from COVID? In order to do that, one would have to look at much more detail at the uh, detail of what was written by the doctor on the on the death certificate and I mean in some senses also there are also going to be deaths which won't be ascribed to COVID which may have in which COVID may have played a part if that person wasn't tested and then of course so the, the indirect deaths will come on to that later where there are people who have for example um, developed uh, uh, the, the symptoms of a heart attack they may decide, for example, with the changes in the health system that they don't, they don't go into hospital when they might have done before. Again, very difficult to know to what extent that death may or may not have occurred if the health system had been different. And to do that, we have to look at excess mortality. So, so to what extent can we trust the number of COVID deaths? I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, decision-making there in determining whether uh, a death is the result of COVID or not. Well, I think we can certainly ascribe very large numbers of cases of people who have come into hospital, been diagnosed with COVID, have all the symptoms of COVID and subsequently die. And we can be clear that many of those hospital deaths will be ascribed to COVID. The actual 
division of all those different groups I've described is something that we will have to be looking at in much more forensic detail in the coming months and years. But there is no doubt that we have seen an enormous number of, of deaths in this country related to COVID. It's then difficult again to make meaningful comparisons between different countries in any exact terms, both because of the stage of the epidemic and also differences in, way, in the ways that countries actually record their deaths. So, uh, Michael, uh, do you think that uh, we can trust the number of deaths that we see from different countries, and do you think they're comparable? We have not. I mean, the, the best source of numbers, at least for all of Europe, is a website called Euromomo. It covers about 300 million people in Europe. And so far, the excess death in the last eight or nine weeks has been about 140,000 people, which is a significant number. It's about uh, a little bit less than three weeks of, of, of normal death. Um, so, you know, that's a large number. It's not, maybe, it's maybe 20% larger than the flu epidemic in 1718, but it's definitely a significant number. Now, we don't even know uh, whether that's mostly Italy or mostly, I mean, we, we, the, the, it, the numbers aren't even broken out by country, but at least the total does seem to be sensible. And you're saying the total there is only 20% more than uh, seasonal flu deaths in 1718? Something like that, yeah. Would you accept that, David? I think that's probably true. A curious paradox here that um, in disasters, death is an absolute matter, but counting deaths is a very relative business. And in mass casualty disasters, it's pretty common. Indeed, it is the rule, not the exception to have trouble getting the numbers. If we look back to the Haiti earthquake of 2010, we have no idea how, how many people died. If we look at the flu pandemic, 1918, 1920, we have absolutely no idea how many deaths there were because in most cases they were not counted at all. Well, at least we are trying to count now, although I'm sure it will be very difficult to get any kind of reliable and reasonable figure with background mortality to take into account. One of the obvious issues here is there are huge variations, are there not, between countries with different uh, deaths per million by you know, uh, not just one order of magnitude, but two orders of magnitude difference. Is this really because of the way that governments are responding, or is it something to do with the way the numbers are being calculated? I think it's because you have a disease that spreads exponentially, if it doesn't spread exponentially, you don't have so many cases. If it does, then you have a large proportion of cases as well as potentially a large number of cases. But I think this is a function of how the disease spreads. So, so you think that the, the, the differences, the huge differences we see between populations is largely to do with the speed of the spread in the different countries? Yes, and in fact, I don't think it necessarily reflects very particularly on the quality of management, at least not after the early stages. It probably does reflect on the quality of management in the initial stages, where there is some prospect of stopping the exponential spread of the disease. And if that is not done, then the disease simply rips away. But are you suggesting that in a lot of cases that's not the case and the, the actual response doesn't make that much difference? I think after a certain amount of time, well, the response does make a difference. Physical distancing makes a considerable distance. But once you've got the disease and once it is disseminated among the public, then it's very much there and it's very easy for the numbers to mount up. What we've seen and the lesson we've learned, at least I hope we've learned it, is that firm early action of an appropriate kind in testing, tracing and preventing and so on and isolating is capable of stopping uh, huge rises in the number of cases in particular places. You should also bear in mind that, of course, the number in a particular country, which is simply an administrative unit, is not likely to be uniform around the country. So then we have to ask, well, why are numbers high in a particular place? It may be population density, it may be the way in which uh, people behave and the spread of the disease follows. Uh, but not, it's certainly not uniform, even in, some, in a fairly small country like Belgium or Denmark. So, Michael, what do you make of all of that? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, in Europe, you know, a lot of countries have been, uh, 
had substantial numbers of, of deaths. Again, it's, it's, it's horrible to count deaths like this, but deaths in some ways are a proxy for how many people are infected because the cases are, are, are not really very valuable. And uh, if you actually look at the numbers, you find that uh, in Europe, the, the places where, and again, where, where I'm making a mistake uh, that I was warned not to make about taking a country as uniform, but it seems that most countries sort of stop when they have about between a half and one person per thousand who has died. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.